Hello there. My name is Ramez Nam. It's an honor to be here with you today. Uh, thank you, Brenda, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, Michael Noble, for bringing me here the first time in 2016, I think, and getting me to come back. So I'm an optimist uh, who is very concerned about climate change. And what I'm going to talk about for the next little bit is the incredible progress that we're making, and yet the very substantial challenges that we still have. Uh, so I'm an investor in climate tech now. I didn't start off that way. I started off in tech. I uh, worked in software for quite a long time. I invest in climate technologies because they matter. You can invest in anything these days. But for me, this is one of the most vital challenges that humanity faces. It amplifies every other environmental challenge that we have. At climate change is, is something that you all know about, you know that it's real. This is temperatures over the last 130 years or so. We've warmed by about 1.2 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. And while we originally had a goal of staying below 2 degrees Celsius, now the bar is 1.5 degrees Celsius is where we'd like to stay. And as you heard, this summer has been the most anomalous summer ever on record in the last 100 and some years of measurements. July was the hottest month. September was the most anomalous month in terms of how much hotter it was than uh, the norm that we would expect in this time. So you know the impact of climate change, but one thing I want to emphasize is when I started in this field, 2010 or so, we thought of climate change as something that affected future generations. We thought it would be coming down the pipe, but now it's evident that it's here right now, whether it's the record fires, the smoke that you all had here, droughts, impacts on coral reefs, and so on. So this is no longer something we have the luxury to wait on. It's something that we have to address right now. The good news is this. We have made enormous progress. The hour is late. There's a lot more we have to do. We have to move faster. But things have changed tremendously. In 2010, we thought the world was on track for something between four five or six degrees Celsius of warming, and up to 12 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And that would be a truly apocalyptic level of warming. Agriculture could fail across large parts of the world, and so on. And while we haven't solved climate change, we have made enormous progress. This chart shows a range of, of estimates in the past. The top line is some estimates from the middle of the last decade. And what's happened over the last two years is we've had a slew of new academic papers that have looked at the pace of our decarbonization, how fast clean energy is getting cheap, especially, and they've updated our estimates of where we're heading to. And we're no longer heading, we think, for a four, five, or six degrees Celsius of warming. It is now plausible that we stay below two degrees Celsius. You look at these papers, there's a range from 1.9, thank you, to, to 2.9, somewhere in there. So what I, what I want to convey is that progress is possible. This happened, this transition happened because of policy that stimulated clean energy deployment, which then made it cheaper. And it's happening now increasingly because of the combination of policy and economics. And the economics of this are uh, generational defining. Literally, $100 trillion to $200 trillion of capital will turn over as we clean up our energy system. And to give you some, some real world present data on that, this is current and historical spending on clean energy. 2004, the world spent $32 billion a year deploying climate technology, solar and wind primarily. $32 billion is not nothing. That's a very real amount of money, obviously. In 2022, we passed a trillion dollars spent in a single year. 1.1 trillion, according to Bloomberg, 1.4 trillion, according to the International Energy Agency. That is an enormous, enormous milestone. Two other things that are relevant here. 2022 was the first year where clean energy spending was larger than spending on fossil fuel extraction. And in 2022, solar alone, spending on solar, was higher than spending on oil extraction. So this is the, the progress that we're making. That <laughs> it is possible to make an impact. 
Now that doubling time is about every four years. If it keeps on growing at that rate, by 2030 it'll be about four trillion dollars a year. The, one of the largest industries uh, on planet Earth. And so let's look at where we've made the most progress because we started off really in cleaning up our electricity supply. Electricity is about a quarter of global human uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this is what's happened over the last 10 years. These are charts of cost of electricity from new built solar or wind or from a new built coal or gas plant. That's the gray band there. In 2010, uh, when I came into this field, there was no place on earth where solar or wind without subsidies were cheaper than power from coal or gas. Around 2015, that changed. We entered a second phase where renewables were competitive for new power in some areas. And now we're entering a third phase where in, in places with exceptionally good sun and wind, it is cheaper sometimes to build a new solar farm or a new wind farm than it is to keep operating an already built and paid for gas or coal plant. <laughs> the clearest evidence of this, the clearest example of this is what's happened in the cost of solar technologies. Look at the cost of solar panels. In 1975, it cost about $100 per watt of power output. This year, now, last month, we're down to about 16 cents as the global average. That's more than a 600-fold price decline. By the way, that, that little spike towards the end. During COVID, we had supply chain issues, we had inflationary issues, and people thought, is the, is the era of declining cost of renewables over? No, we worked through those kinks. We still have some challenges. Wind power costs have gone up they will come down again. And so we'll see this exponential trend in cost decline continue. And the other thing I want to communicate about this is that the deployment of clean energy and the progress we've made on it has blown past all the forecasts of official or credible uh, forecasters. So in 2010, I came into this field. I came from tech, so I had a different perspective. The International Energy Agency put out this forecast for what happened with the cost of solar over the next almost 40 years, by 2050. This is an exponential chart, by the way. Every tick is a doubling. I, a naive software person, said, well, I think if you just look at the, the charts of growth, solar costs will drop like this, about five times faster than what the IEA said. I was wrong. Solar costs have actually dropped like this, twice as fast as the biggest optimists in this field. And so that is what gives us uh, some degree of hope. This also means that estimates of how fast we would deploy these technologies have been woefully short. Every year, the International Energy Agency puts out their World Energy Outlook. They put out forecasts for things like how much solar will the world deploy each year. Those colored lines are successive years of forecasts from the IEA of how much solar the world would deploy every future year. And the black line is actual growth, right? And let's update it for, for this year. It looks like this. In fact, I've had to update this chart three times this year, and it's already wrong. We're going to hit close to 400 gigawatts, so off the top of this chart. Now, we still want to move faster, but in every way, these clean energy technologies are just able to exceed what people expect. And it's not just solar. This is growth around the world of power generation from wind, from solar, electric vehicle sales, which are growing about twice the pace of solar, and battery deployment. All of these are, are exponentials, if you will, that are just growing without bounds. They're still at a relatively small fraction of our energy system, but their improvement in cost and their growth rate is just staggering. And it's not just solar. It's happened to a somewhat extent wind, batteries, and now hydrogen as well. And so if we zoom out and we say, uh, what's the cost of energy from different sources? This is from a paper from Oxford last year. Across the bottom here, over a more than 100-year period, you've got the costs of oil, coal, and gas. And there's no clear trend line. They just fluctuate. They bounce up and down. Because commodities, you can get cheaper drilling and so on, but you're competing against the depletion of the resource. Whereas 
solar, wind, and batteries aren't commodities, they're technologies. And technologies just get cheaper over time. So this is that crossover we were talking about. And if you want to look at this in terms of deployment, this year, solar and wind we've got 90% of new power added to the grid around the world. Now, we'd like it to be 200%. We'd like to be decommissioning coal plants and gas plants at an astoundingly faster rate and have all of the growth be renewables. We're not there yet, but you can see how that yellow band and that blue band have just grown over the last several years. Energy storage is the, the next frontier, and battery prices have dropped at a pace like solar. Dropped by about a factor of 10 over the last decade. That slow down at the very end is lithium prices going up over the last couple of years. They've fallen in half in the last six months. So this trend will continue as well. Batteries attached to renewable plants uh, have a certain characteristic that I'll come back to in a sec. But I, I want to again show how the experts forecasted change here versus what really happened. Here's from 2013, uh, the US Department of Energy, their forecast for how battery costs would drop. They dropped by about half over the next 40 odd years. The blue and red lines are optimists, Bloomberg and Navigant. This is what actually happened with battery prices. So again, technology costs are just decades and decades ahead of the leading forecasters. We're moving into longer duration storage. I won't dwell on this too long, but we have now dozens of startups and projects that are aiming to do 12 hours of storage, solve the day-night cycle, or longer. Multi-day storage is a technology on the frontier still, but it is coming down the pipe. Now, all of that having been said, there are still some very real challenges that we have in this transition, even in just the electricity sector. We have the problem of seasonality and weather. We have uh, new electricity loads as we install heat pumps to heat buildings, and especially as we deploy electric vehicles, that's going to draw a lot more power. We have impacts on the grid. We have industrial decarbonization. These are all sectors that we have to work on harder. This is showing wind and solar over the continental US over the course of a year. And what you see here is, of course, solar peaks in the summer, uh, but it's quite low in the winter. Wind peaks in winter and spring. So the system we really want to build goes beyond the borders of any one state or any one uh, region even. We want to integrate these renewables across continent size areas so we can take the best wind and the best solar and put them together in sort of a harmonic symphony of renewables to meet our needs. Uh, can you get the slides back up, please? Now, so where we are now is we're at the beginning still of this hockey stick, this S-curve. Solar and wind are about 12, 13% of electricity globally. Uh, they're more than 25% uh, here in Minnesota. Over the next decade, driven by policy and these incredibly low prices, we're going to see them surge. Uh, the UK think tank Ember thinks they will triple in how much power they provide to the grid around the world in the next seven to eight years. But we will hit these challenges as we get to higher and higher penetration of renewables on the grid. And there's multiple ways to solve that. We talk about resources like clean, firm power, nuclear, these multi-day uh, storage batteries. But by far, the simplest, most reliable, and lowest cost way to get a cleaner grid is to build out the grid, to build out more transmission that brings in the best wind and the best solar from around the world, or from around the, the different parts of the country, complementing one another. Now, that might look daunting, but to give you a global perspective, here's the solar resource of China. Uh, in China, all the population is on the coast, on the east coast. The best sun and wind are in the interior, in the west and the northwest. So in China, you see ultra-high voltage distribution or transmission lines that go 2,100 miles and carry power from the interior to the coast. For context, in Europe, that would go from Spain to Germany, 
And in the US, you could take solar power from New Mexico to New York. You could bring wind and solar in and out of Minnesota, getting a cleaner grid uh, for Minnesota and for the rest of the nation. But this is an area where, while we're making huge investments, in this area in particular, MISO announced a $10 billion transmission project last year we are still not making progress fast enough. And the barriers to this are primarily regulatory. We know we can build transmission, we know it uh, is cost effective, but we still have to convince people, landowners, states along the way, uh, that it's okay to build these transmission lines to cross their property and move clean energy from place to place. If we don't build out new transmission, Jesse Jenkins at Princeton believes that 80% of the decarbonization benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act will not be achieved. So this is a vital area, and if there's one thing I'd ask you to, to advocate for, it's this. We have to be YIMBYs, not NIMBYs. We have to acknowledge that we have to build new infrastructure if we want to clean up our society. So that's electricity. We are making enormous progress there. The second area, of course, is transportation. And it is now clear that electrification of transport, of ground transport, is inevitable. It's no longer a question of whether it will happen, it's only a question of how fast it will happen. And it's happening at a staggering rate. This is the growth of electric vehicle sales around the world. We are now selling more than a million electric vehicles per month. And we've passed the peak of sales of gasoline-powered vehicles. That happened in 2017. Since then, all the growth in the automotive sector has been electric. And one thing that's true is that capital chases growth, talent chases growth, the internal combustion engine is not a sector that any large auto manufacturer is heavily investing in right now. And so we've seen EVs grow at about twice the pace of solar. And again, forecasters have missed this. Here's the Department of Energy, uh, 2015. The red line is their forecast for how many electric cars would there be on US roads with a 200 mile range. By 2040, they forecasted 20,000 of them, right? <laughs> Tesla alone is selling about a million cars a year. So this is about as wrong as you can be. And it will just happen faster because we're still at an early stage of electric vehicles. They're still premium products, but that is changing rapidly. And what we're going to see is that electric vehicles are just definitively going to be the cheapest option there is. And here's why. This is the engine and drivetrain of a gasoline-powered car, about 1,000 moving parts. And this is the engine and drivetrain <laughs> of an electric car. Right? So there are si simply simpler devices. The only reasons they've been more expensive are that they were built at smaller scale and that batteries have been expensive. And both of those are changing over time. And so in addition to the, the capital cost, we also see these benefits in the operating cost. The gasoline car wastes three quarters of its energy as heat. Small engines lose a lot of heat. When you hit the brakes, it's friction. You lose that energy. The electric vehicle has super efficient electric motors, and when you brake, it sucks power back into the batteries. So what we see is that the cost of operating an electric vehicle is about one half to one quarter of what it is to operate a similarly uh, sized gasoline vehicle. There's also massive uh, maintenance cost advantages here. So it's already the case in many parts of the world that electric vehicles from a total cost of ownership standpoint are cheaper. The blue bar is the cost of buying the vehicle, but because the cost of energy and maintenance is so much lower, the total cost is actually already lower. And by 2030, this could be in a whole new phase, where the electric vehicle will be cheaper on a walkaway basis, what you pay in cash, and remarkably cheaper to operate. And so we will see this spread into commercial vehicles, and we'll see this put more demands on the grid. If we electrify all transport in the US, 
it will roughly increase electricity demand in the U.S. by about 50%. It'll save American consumers about $400 billion a year in gasoline, and it'll be about $100 billion a year in new electricity sales. But somebody has to build that grid in order for this transition to succeed. And when we think about that, there, there's a variety of challenges, but I'll just accelerate a little bit here. Oil is a global commodity uh, that doesn't always help America. The people that make the most money off oil are not always our friends. But we are reaching the point where oil is nearing its peak of global demand. If you look at the different ways that we use oil, about two thirds of them are at risk of disruption from electric vehicles and solar and so on. And we already see that electric vehicles are destroying about a million and a half barrels a day of oil demand. That's only about one and a half Two percent. But if EVs keep growing at this pace, we will see oil demand peak in the second half of this decade and then start to decline. And even uh, oil majors are starting to say that. I'll close by talking about some of the unsolved challenges that we have. So we've looked at electricity and ground transport. But there's still major areas that we're just starting to work on. Building heat, of course, agriculture and deforestation, a quarter of our global emissions. But the one that is now moving forward more rapidly than I expected is heavy industry, decarbonizing things like steel making and cement. Steel is about 7 8% of global emissions. It's about three times the size of all aviation, for example. And for uh, the first time in just the last two or three years, we've seen real progress in both technology and financing to decarbonize these heavy industrial sectors. And one of the things that gets talked about the most in this is the use of hydrogen, green hydrogen made from clean electrons to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's a very versatile tool. It's still very early. You hear hydrogen talked about for a lot of things that it probably shouldn't be, and we'll see some crash of that. But when you look at the ways that we can use hydrogen, we won't use it for everything. Anything that we can electrify, we will. But for things like heavy industry, making steel, perhaps making fuels to go into existing aircraft and ships, we'll see that uh, accelerate and be an important part of the solution. This, like electrification, will further increase electricity demand. If we decarbonize using hydrogen, all these other sectors, that by itself could double global demand for electricity. So again, if we want to succeed in decarbonizing, we have to build. And with that, I'll say that I continue to be an optimist because every year we make progress faster than the year before. We've seen this with consumers demanding increasingly that their companies purchase clean electricity or provide clean products. And we've seen policy momentum. We've seen momentum uh, for a number of reasons. The war in Ukraine has accelerated Europe's decarbonization. We've seen heat pump sales uh, double, triple, or quadruple in some European countries. In the US, of course, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which I think is still wildly underestimated in just how enormous an impact it has. This is uh, federal projected spending on clean energy technologies, and you see this enormous growth, and this probably understates the size of the IRA. And of course, here in Minnesota, you've been leaders as well. And so thank you for uh, amazing progress in taking action on climate change and committing to decarbonizing the grid here entirely. So is the problem solved? No, we are in a race between how fast we can innovate in both policy and technology and how fast we do damage. And we are moving faster than anyone believed we could five or 10 years ago, but the hour is also growing late. So we are now in a phase where we have canceled the apocalypse, most likely, but we haven't moved the needle as far down as we would like. 
And every tenth of a degree Celsius matters enormously. And so I'm honored to be here with an organization that is working to accelerate this transition. And I think all that we can do, the most important thing we can do, is continue to take action. Thank you very much.